Um, so for those who don't know, the NHS Python community is a large community of practice dedicated to supporting people in the NHS and the wider healthcare sector to understand, learn about Python and open code. And we're very, very lucky today. Today's show and tell will be led by Zella King. And she'll be talking you through her Python package she and her team created at UCLH. And she developed this to predict short term demand for emergency beds. And this is called the patient flow package. So Zella is a healthcare data scientist in the clinical operational research unit at University College London. She applies data analytics, machine learning, programming and organisational psychologies as tools for better decision making in healthcare operations. She works in the interface between universities and the NHS and collaborates with all kinds of people, clinicians, researchers and NHS leaders to address clinical uh, practical challenges in the delivery of healthcare. And she's currently working as an embedded researcher in UCLH to help tackle some of the hospital's operational problems using operational research and data science. And with others, she's developed this real-time application that is used daily for patient by the patient flow team at UCLH to predict demand for patient emergency beds. And she is the lead author on a paper about this work that is being published in Nature Digital Medicine, which is very exciting. And this um, application has been, in fact, shortlisted for the HSJ Digital Award in Improving Urgent and Emergency Care. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Zella. Before I just do that, if you have any questions, make sure to put them in the chat and we'll field them to Zella uh, after she's presented. Um, so Zella, over to you. Cool. Thank you, Mary, so much. Thank you for the uh, invitation and for your introduction. Um, and I shall try to live up to um, everything that you've said. Uh, so, yes, this is about a Python resource for modelling short term demand for emergency beds. And as you said, Mary, I've been working um, at UCLH for four years on this project, which began as a really small proof of concept. Could we use real time data to predict emergency demand? And it's grown into an application that the bed managers use and we're still expanding and, and developing in ways that I will I will talk about. Um, but I think the sort of the purpose of, of sharing this work is um, there is a lot of interest in short term predictive modelling in the urgent emergency care sector. So if you can anticipate where pressures are going to build up in the next sh short term, I'm talking eight, 12 hours, you can take actions potentially to escalate, to divert ambulances, to reconfigure services, to redeploy people to discharge patients earlier. So we know how much under pressure hospitals are at the moment. And, and so there's lots of interest in could we do more to understand and anticipate and, and react to developing uh, situations. And some people are sceptical about, about the idea that you could uh, model this because you can't predict, unlike elective admissions, you can't predict how many people are going to show up. But you can predict, you can allow for the natural variability in these kind of presentations and still make predictions that are useful for, for daily planning. So the purpose of this repo is really to show how we've done this at UCLH and how we've made use of some relatively sort of available to everybody things. So we are obviously fortunate we've got an electronic health record uh, data um, you know, uh, system at UCLH um, and it feeds through into real time um, database that we can use for modelling. But what we're doing with that is not very um, groundbreaking. We're using simple machine learning um, algorithms and other simple contexts from probability theory to, to make models that, that run in real time and make useful predictions. And so the purpose for kind of sharing this today is really to hope that this kind of modeling might become sort of more familiar and more adopted um, by NHS analysts and others in the kind of healthcare sector. So in the talk, I'm going to talk about the patient flow repository, what's in it and how it might be useful to you. And I'm anticipating that on this call, you may be at different sort of levels of interest in actually grappling with Python. So I'm going to try and pitch uh, this talk in very, at various different sort of levels, depending on where you might be at. Um, and I think the reason this is worth paying attention to, the original things about this are partly that we're showing how to prepare electronic health record data for real time prediction. I think a lot of modeling is done based on hospital visits that have finished. Um, but when you're trying to predict in real time whether someone's going to need a bed or not, you have to have data that looks as if the visits haven't finished. And so I'll show you the data structure that we use um, and hopefully this will give you a sense of sort of how if you were to do to tackle a similar problem, how your data set might look. 
Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is we're kind of aggregating this from individual level, patient level predictions to bed level predictions. So there's a lot of work done using machine learning, often by academics, taking individual patient level data and generating models saying this person will be have this probability of admission. And then there's lots of work by hospital people taking sort of average bed uh, demand numbers and then using simple heuristics like how many people did we admit in the last six Tuesdays will plan for that number of beds. Um, but not many sort of things bring these two together, the individual level into the sort of bed level. And so and that's where it's useful to bed managers. So I'm going to talk about how we do that. I've already done a webinar about this modeling choices and some and a bit about how we restructure the data in order to make these kind of predictions. I did that for a webinar hosted by the NHSR community. And so you can access that. And if you're interested in sort of the why we're doing it, the way we're doing it, I'm not going to cover that here, um, but you can find that with some sort of output from the UCLH data set, uh, which I won't be showing here. Um, you can find it on YouTube or, or follow that link. Um, so please sort of consider that as a way to gain some further sort of context for what I'm talking about today. So I'm anticipating that you might fall into one of these categories um, and that might be your reason for showing up today. So possibly you're an interested bystander, in which case it might be useful to you to read about uh, the people that we're building these models for and what they need from predictive models. And maybe you'll get some ideas about how your hospital or other hospitals might use real time data. Uh, so I'll say a bit that's sort of projected at your level and then perhaps you're interested in looking at some of the modeling and following the logic of what's being done as a kind of model explorer. Um, but you're quite happy not to get too into the weeds of Python code, just interested in high level steps. So I'll show you where you could be looking to find stuff that could be interesting to you and particularly to see the output of what's being produced because a lot of the resources are, is communicated in the form of uh, what are called notebooks. So those, if you haven't come across them before, they combine code, snippets of code, the output from the code, and then commentary together in one place. So it makes them sort of accessible for someone who doesn't actually need to run the, 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 the code. Um, or maybe you're a Pythonic implementer, uh, in which case you might want to go a bit deeper. So I'll show, I'll give you some signposts about where you might look if you want to follow your nose into bits of code that seem interesting. I'm going to talk about how you can run the notebooks uh, with a provided data set or or anonymized real data set. I'll talk about that and hopefully give you some ideas about how you might try implementing this, maybe even with your own data. Uh, and then finally, if you're sort of interested in the kind of package aspect of this, then I'll talk about some of my sort of learning from developing a package and would really welcome your comments on and your contributions to sort of how this evolves over time. So just to, just as a bit of background, um, which informs everything that is going to follow, at UCLH, the bed managers review capacity five times each day, and they send out emails about it four times a day, and three times a day they have a huddle where they gather to talk about how to react to the developing situation. So the idea of sending predictions of five times each day informs everything in this repository. Um, and there's more about sort of them and what they're looking for in the modeling, as I've already said in a previous um, webinar. So check out uh, that. And then also the first two of the notebooks I'm going to introduce in a second. So what we're doing with this modeling is we're producing some output that will help them inform not just the current situation, but also what they think is going to happen in the next eight hours. And the output of the modeling looks like this. So it is a spreadsheet. It is divided into four high level specialty areas, medicine, surgical, hematology, oncology and paediatric. Uh, columns B and C in this spreadsheet to just report how many patients in these areas that they already know about that have a decision to admit. And the modeling is the part that delivers columns D to G. So with different levels of probability, um, first of all, D and E give a pred prediction for the patients currently in the emergency department. And when I say emergency department in this talk, I'm also including the same day emergency care uh, section of emergency medicine. Um, so consider ED to, to encompass both of them. Um, so you've got columns D and E for patients um, currently in, then that's using the real time data. And then columns F and G are for the patients who 
haven't arrived yet, but may be expected to arrive within the prediction window that we're interested in, which in our case is eight hours, but that is a parameter and uh, it could be changed. So you could say, actually, I'm more interested in doing this over a four hour period or a 12 hour period. One thing I would say is the longer you extend that prediction window, the more important your predictions become the people who haven't arrived yet. And so you're losing some of the benefit of using real time data. That's why we keep this to a prediction window of eight hours. The other thing I wanted just to emphasize is that we use uh, what we call an aspirational approach to demand. So we want to give the hospital a true picture of how many beds they would need if everyone was admitted according to the ED targets, which are currently uh, at the time that we developed the repo, it was 76% in four hours. Um, I think the current target to 78% of patients should be admitted or discharged in, in eight hours, uh, four, sorry, four hours. And that's going to increase, I think, next April to 80%. So we want to give the hospital and each specialty a sense of how many beds are they going to need in order to help their colleagues in the ED actually deliver on those targets. Because often people, you know, the, the ED targets fall down because there aren't beds available for the patients flowing through. So this is what we call an aspirational approach and we bring that into the modeling in ways that um, are shown in the notebooks. So there are actually three models that uh, you will find documented. So there's, uh, for the patients in the ED now, there are two, uh, an admissions model, which is an XG boost classifier, which predicts each patient's probability of admission. Um, and you'll find that in notebook 4A. I'll give you a, a sort of an overview of the notebooks in a second. And then there's a specialty model which uses a sort of custom um, predictor called a sequence predictor to predict a probability of admission. So if someone's going to be admitted, then it says what's their probability of being admitted to med medicine, surgery, hemonc, pediatric, etc. And there's a third model which I've called the weighted Poisson predictor, where we, and we use this for the yet to arrive patients to work out um, how many yet to arrive will be admitted within the prediction window. And then you'll also see um, how we generate the aspirational curve. So let's um, uh, jump in a bit and just take a quick look. I'm going to make that a bit larger. Um, so you'll see, um, I've, I've come up here to the patient flow um, notebooks folder and you'll see the, the notebooks there. Um, so you'll be able to click on these and see inside them uh, snippets of code and um, uh, and the output. So I'm just going to load one for an example. Um, so you'll see here code and as we scroll down, some output as well. So you can see what the data sets look like. I'm not going to go into any of the details of any of the notebooks. It's just to let you know that those are there. Uh, so in terms of the sort of the the uh, flow, natural flow of them. The first two are don't include any code and they're just really introducing the users and, and, their, and their requirements. Notebook three shows, uh, goes through each variable in the data sets and gives you a sort of sense of how the variable splits between the patients who are and aren't admitted. And then in terms of the sort of actual, the modeling part, notebook 4A uh, trains a model that will predict probability of admission from the ED. Um, and 4B is a kind of important one because it's showing the aggregation step that I was speaking about earlier, where we go from individual patient level being the unit of analysis to kind of taking that up to bed level. And what that really means is you're moving from um, patients to moments in time, what we call prediction moments. So at any moment in time, let's say there are 60 patients in the ED and ESDEC, you want to know how many beds you're going to need for those 60 patients. And then there'll be some observed number of beds that was actually in, a, in, in the past needed for those patients that you'll use to evaluate the models. But it's your, your unit of analysis becomes the prediction moment and a set of patients that are in the ED at that time, um, rather than necessarily being interested in the individual predictions for each patient. Although we do, do also evaluate those. Then 4C does change the, uh, the specialty model that will be used alongside the emissions model. And those two working together will give a prediction for anyone in the ED about which uh, specialty they're likely to end up in and therefore the demand within that specialty. And then finally, notebook 4D predicts the demands for the patients yet to arrive. I mentioned evaluation and um, I should say that um, 
evaluation is really important for understanding, especially if you're putting models in front of users. When you're evaluating aspirational models, it's a bit more difficult to compare them with observed numbers who are actually admitted in an eight hour period. So um, I'll ex I explore that a little bit in the notebook about evaluation, um, which is still a work in progress. Uh, uh, but there's a lot you can do to kind of understand the the sort of, you know, kind of uh, performance of your models. And on as as it is as it stands now, the repo. If you if you look at it now, all the notebook output will show you the results from the from real patient data. Um, but it's a truncated data set which is uh, only nine months long in total and that includes a test set and has a few features have been kind of um, condensed in order to protect patient characteristics so for example age has been grouped and we've removed some some protective characteristics so the performance on on the uclh side is better than what you'll see in the in the model evaluation notebook but it will show you how one can go about evaluating these models. And then finally, notebook six brings it all together and says, let's imagine we're trying to do a real time prediction. Um, we'll, we'll grab a random moment from the test set and show how to generate the predictions on, on a given moment in time. So looking into the Python a little more, um, to give you a sense of what's in the repo and what isn't. Um, so we have a UCLH EPIC is our EHR and frontline staff are entering data into EPIC and there's a database called EMAP which is updated in real time so we'll always hold the latest stuff known about a patient and we use EMAP in two different ways so we'll um, carve out a training set of past visits uh, and use that to train the models and that there are two sets of data one for the ED visits and then one for the inpatient arrivals and I'll say more about those in a moment um, and then in real time we'll pull the set of patients currently in the ED from EMAP and then we'll serve up that data and the models together to generate these predictions. The repo doesn't show the final step which is converting those predictions that you can see in the kind of form of a dictionary there um, into a spreadsheet. Uh, my colleague John Gillam at UCLH has done all the amazing software engineering that that makes this a kind of application that uh, stands up and runs every day. Uh, and his his bit of the code deals with the spreadsheet side and, e and the emailing. So you won't see that in the patient flow repo, but you'll see everything that I've kind of highlighted in the shaded area. So you'll see the training data sets, um, you'll see how the models are trained and you'll see how the predictions are generated. Um, just just a little bit more about the data let's go there now and just have a look at that folder so in the i'm looking now at a folder called data synthetic uh, you'll see here on the left here there is a there are several folders that relate to data i'm just going to start with the synthetic data if i open up inpatient arrivals this is the the file that's used for the yet training the model for the yet to arrive patients and you see we've got an arrival date time for each of them. Um, we've got their sex, although we don't actually um, use that currently, uh, which specialty they were admitted to and whether they're a child or not. And then each visit is allocated into a training validation or test set. Main reason for that is that so that you will replicate the same results that, that we got on the same kind of data. So um, the ED visits uh, is too big to load as a browser, you can download it. Um, I can open up in Excel, you'll see it here. So just to get a sense of sort of what kind of data we're using. Um, so there is a uh, each, there's a visit number which has been sort of um, uh, changed into a random number, so it's not identifiable. All the dates have been pushed into the future by a number of weeks, which is unknown to you. So therefore, the day of week sort of integrity of the data is retained, um, but the seasonality isn't necessarily. So this won't necessarily be a, a, a date in March, um, but it would be whatever day of the week the 1st of March is, uh, 2031. Um, so you've got the, the elapsed length of stay um, in seconds, the sex, the, um, the patient age, the arrival method, 
um, scrolling across. And so you start to see things that might be quite interesting when you're trying to predict whether someone's going to be admitted from ED, like, for example, visited resus. So if a patient has visited the resuscitation area, they're probably um, in urgent and acute need. Uh, so that might be a strong predictor of being admitted. Uh, whereas if they go to the urgent treatment centre, then they're that's more like a sort of GP level um, need. And so they're less likely to be admitted. So there is the data in synthetic form. And if you're wondering about sort of what all of those columns actually represent, there are data dictionaries for both set, both data sets um, in both Markdown and CSV form, uh, whatever is easier for you to view in your setup. So, um, there's also a, fol a folder there called Data Public, um, which is empty. I've provided the synthetic data because I'm really keen that you can see exactly what we're doing, and the synthetic data provides that. Uh, UCLH have been amazing in terms of agreeing that we can release this because we had kind of ongoing conversations with Information Governance and the Caldecott Guardian in order to make sure they were okay with doing this. Um, and they concluded that they would be happy for me to share a data set um, that is based on real patient data, but not to put it on GitHub because for understandable reasons, they then lose control over it. So they're happy to share that with people who contact me as long as you acknowledge that this is not for resharing and this is you know, just for your own sort of learning and research purposes. So You'll, so you'll find the, the synthetic data. And if you if you use it for training models, you'll get an amazing performance, like 99% accuracy, because it's been derived based on different distributions from admitted and discharged patients. Um, so therefore, it looks incredible if you run it. But it's not really like working with real patient, patient data. However, it's really useful if you just want to understand how this code is working. Um, and then if you... Um, receive if you if you do decide to cl clone the repo and, and work with it yourself uh, you'll need some data inside the data public folder because that's where the uh, notebooks will look for data so your options are either you copy across the synthetic data or you contact me for the real data and I've mentioned the data dictionaries already um, going then a bit more into the depths of the python uh, so inside the, the repo is, this is a common convention that you have the, the sort of top level and then you have a patient, um, a folder called source and then you repeat the name of the module there because that's then how you uh, refer to it on import statements. So inside here we'll see um, a bunch of Python scripts, some of them are inside subfolders. And I'm just going to give you an overview of what each of these uh, sort of sub modules are aiming to do, just to give you a, like some orientation. I'm not going to go into any of the detail of any of the Python, but if there's anything to do with loading anything, you'll find it in the load.py. So that whether that's loading configuration files, data sets, um, or models that you've trained and saved. Um, by the way, there won't be any trained models in the repo as it is. You you would have to if you wanted to run um, the code yourself, you'd have to step through the training steps yourself. Um, there's a module called prepare, which does a bunch of things to to uh, prepare data for input to model training or inference. Um, there's a train module, which does all of the actual pre-processing and training of the models. Um, I'll come back to predictors. And then there's a predict module, which uh, is used at the time when you want to generate predictions, which is either when you're sort of evaluating, looking at the output, or when you're doing real time um, inference. Uh, I've actually separated out the aggregate step, although it is really part of the prediction step, uh, because I think it's quite useful to have that separate um, and see exactly how it is that we turn patient level probabilities into aggregate distributions. And there's some simple kind of maths and probability theory inside there. And I kind of my, I've learned a lot from working with, uh, I'm not a mathematician, but I work with applied mathematicians at um, UCL. I've learned a lot from working with them and I've kind of come to understand that actually you, to be an analyst generating bed demand predictions, you don't necessarily need to understand this maths. So one of the motivations for putting this repository together was to make that kind of functionality available without other people necessarily having to code it and understand it. Um, there's a vis module for uh, plotting functions 
uh, that give you output for a bunch of the things above. Um, and then the predictors, there are two custom predictions which have been developed for the specialty prediction and the yet to arrive uh, prediction, which I covered a little bit, the sort of logical app modeling in the NHSR webinar. So if you're sort of interested in delving into those a bit, might be useful to watch that webinar to, to get a sense of what we're doing there. So if you do want to actually try and install this and run, you'll find the installation instructions here. Is that some under in that's part of the main notebook and the move to the directory? So the intention is that this will be ultimately installable with a pip install. Um, so you'd install it just like you would install pandas or numpy. Um, we, um, we're not there yet. So, but in the meantime, you can clone it and then install following instructions uh, at that link. Um, if you're watching this recording later, those instructions might have changed. So check out the main readme uh, at the root of the patient flow repository. Currently, it does require you to have Python 3.10. I'm curious to know how much of a constraint that might be for people in NHS organisations. Um, ideally, you, you are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks and, and know how to set up an environment on your local computer um, to interact with them. If you don't, there's lots of resources online to help you with that. Um, and it's recommended that you create a virtual environment after you've cloned the repo, before you install, uh, create a virtual environment to run it in so that you won't have any package conflicts with other packages that might be installed already in your environment. But you know, that's up to you. So one, let's say you've managed to install it and you're up and running. Here are some suggestions of things you could do. So um, you can interact with the data. Obviously, I've, I've shown you the, the data set. Um, you can use Notebook 3 uh, for an overview of uh, each, each variable and what's in it. Um, and you might even consider creating your own data in um, the same or a similar structure. Uh, and then you know, try and put that through the notebooks. Um, I would really encourage you to look at the configuration file. So let's just jump across to that for a second. Um, so this is a YAML file and it kind of gives the uh, all of the notebooks and all of the scripts kind of refer to this when uh, uh, when when looking for the parameters with, within which to run the modeling. Uh, so some of these things will allow you to to play with the configuration and, and try running, you know, slightly different setup. For example, you could try changing the prediction window, for example, to four hours, and you would do that in the in the YAML file where I've it's in minutes here. So that's 480, that's eight hours. You could change that, for example, and, and see um, how that changed the output. And the other thing you might you might, for example, try is changing the target proportion of patients admitted. Uh, within four hours. So here I've got X1, which is a target number of hours for ED admissions, and the next one is um, paired with Y1, your proportion. And I said earlier that we're using this aspirational curve where we're aiming for 76% of patients to be admitted within four hours. But you might say, what would it be like if I did 85% instead? And so you could change that number, rerun the models. And what you should see is you should see a more accelerated processing of patients. Uh, more of them will get through more quickly. Um, so you should see your demand predictions increase um, relative to running with 76%. And then if you're already sort of keen to sort of experiment with the machine learning side, uh, you could change the features input into the, the machine learning model. Um, I've actually shown the full set of features and I've shown a very min minimal model with only just one or two features. So that would give you an idea of how you could experiment. For example, there's location data in that um, spreadsheet as i said earlier like you've got the locations of patients um uh which bit where in the ed they visited so you could experiment with like if i add the location data in how much how additive is that relative to just having the minimum minimal model of like age and a, an arrival method or whatever um i've actually commented out the hyperparameter grid i only use one set of, of permutations uh, because when I'm running this on a UCLH uh, server it's, it's it's not rich in processing power um, so uh, but you could definitely experiment with uh, the hyperparameter grid um, within XGBoost or indeed if you know about machine learning maybe it would be interesting I haven't done this to, to swap out XGBoost for another classifier in the um, nature paper that Mary referenced we did compare 
XG boost with random forest um, and with log logistic regression. Um, but that was a, few, a couple of years ago. I haven't done anything on that since. So I'd be curious if you, if you found another classifier that worked better. And one uh, caveat is that in the data provided, um, these these parameters in, in the config file need to align to the data provided. So it has prediction times of um, 6 o'clock, 9.30, midday, 3.30 and 10 p.m. Um, so the models, if you if you tried to change those, there wouldn't be any data available to you at those times. So you'd need to keep those the same. And similarly, the, the training validation test set dates need to match those in the provided data. Just a couple of words on um, sort of reflections on the packaging side. So I partway through doing this work, I was inspired by the idea. Actually, I was inspired at the Health and Care Analytics Conference last summer, 2023. Uh, it was the first time I heard about reproducible analytical pipelines. Um, and I kind of instantly knew that that's what I wanted to be able to achieve if I was ever going to share this this work and this code, then I needed to understand those and understand how to make other people easily adopt my own uh, my own programs. Um, and then I was inspired by a, an online book by Tom Monks from the University of Exeter, which then talks about using um, uh, data science and, and operational research in Python. Um, and so he, he actually sort of made me think, oh yeah, I could probably do this as a package. So that's where the kind of initial uh, ideas came from, but I already had a lot of code by that point. So then sort of retrofitted a template developed by some colleagues at UCL in the um, Advanced Research Computing Center. Um, and this has brought a lot of uh, very useful but retrospective <laughs> elements that are helpful. So linting, the idea of uh, formatting your code correctly according to kind of true Pythonic principles. Um, it's very hard to do that in retrospect. So there are some linting requirements imposed in this repository, but not as it's not as tight as it should be. Um, so that's something I've learned. Um, the template automatically generates documentation, which is which is quite cool. So there is that there's an API which all of this this whole site is automatically generated from the from the sort of doc strings in the code. So this gives you a reference for uh, all of the functions. And if I've done the documentation correctly, you will have um, in, information about what the parameters are. Um, in, input to a function, what it returns, and any notes that I've written. Um, so that's all automated. And then I've discovered about tests, which are obviously important for this, these kind of engineering projects. So there is a test script, which will on the fly generate some data and then try and run the models, uh, or, uh, train models and then run them and just check that everything works. So that's really useful for catching code errors if you've done something which has broken uh, some of the workflow. And then there's a pyproject.toml file, which I wasn't familiar with until now, which kind of manages the things above and tells the package what to do in terms of linting documentation and so on. Plus workflows on GitHub was, was also new to me. Um, but I have to, I think it's just worth making the observation that I don't think I would have taken on this project if I'd had to search for every solution to every problem in Stack Overflow. Um, it's been incredibly empowering to be able to ask ChatGPT or Claude how to solve problems and uh, put in pieces of code. And if you don't already do that, I think I would highly recommend it as a way of just becoming more efficient, more knowledgeable, and actually, uh, I think a better programmer because it, um, it's amazing what can be done with the assistance of one of those language models. In terms of next steps, um, so this is still a kind of pre-release. There's still some documentation missing. Um, and then I mentioned that the evaluation notebook is work in progress. I want to write some functions that will support the evaluation in a neater way than the, than, than currently. Um, and then once that's done, the, the thought is to publish this as a package on PyPy so that you can install it using pip. Um, and in that regard, and your feedback is very useful and welcome. If you try using it and you find things that don't work for you, then I'd really be grateful to know about them. Um, and this is part of ongoing work at UCLH. So we, for future releases, my hope is to continue to add 
functionality based on what we're doing at UTH. So Hacker 2024 with Alison Clements, who is the Director of Operations at UCLH. We did a joint presentation on our, our sort of vision for how UCLH will have real-time data, not just at the high level of medical, surgical, um, and hemonc that I showed you, but actually at a much more detailed granular level by specialty, exact, exactly what is there. That they expect to have missions, how many patients from that area do you think will be discharged and that kind of when you then add in elective and other admission flows that don't come through ED, then you've got a picture of what's the net position for any given specialty in eight hours time. And that becomes incredibly powerful because if you can say the example we give in the presentation is if you're a, a consultant in gastroenterology and you know that you've got a bunch of some patients in ED and SDEC and you've got some emergency admission from clinic. Uh, there's people who belong to you in, in the intensive care unit and you've got people on your ward. Um, there's a, that's a lot of patients to keep track of in different places. And so your own sort of understanding of your footprint and the demand for your resources at the moment in time is very difficult to kind of comprehend. And so our hope is that this by continuing to do this kind of short-term modelling on both the admissions and the discharges side, we'll be able to give consultants and operations managers a sort of their, their real true kind of, this is my position right now, that I'm likely to be under pressure. Uh, I'm not likely to be under pressure overnight. And, and then that means that escalation actions are taken with timely and accurate information, not taken on the basis of sort of, you know, guesswork. So that's our hope for the work at UCLH. Um, so that's, those are all the things I had to say. I'm sure you will have questions. Um, so yeah, over to you, Mary, to to field the questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Sela. It's absolutely fantastic presentation. We have quite a few questions and if you do have extra questions, please um, feel free to put them in the chat or put your hand up. Um, so we have a question from Tom and he wonders, I think you said there was some code developed by your colleague, John, mm -hmm. to help generate those predictions into like dynamically into spreadsheets and also to to do automatic emailing. Is that right? Is that yeah. code available anywhere? Um, that code is not available. Um, I think it might be uh, one day, but the, the because it's more UCLH specific. Um, his repository deals with all of the the kind of uh, formatting of the data from the UCLH sort of databases in the first place. We may not publish that, but I will definitely get, I'll talk to him about it because if there's interest, um, we, we could probably incorporate it inside patient flow if that would be useful. Yeah, I think there's quite a lot of interest in how to operationalize these kind of models and mm -hmm. uh, make yeah. it into real time. So, yeah, yeah. that's useful. Thanks. Definitely. Um, there's also another question from Bethan. About seasonality, I wonder if Bethan, did you mind? Would you mind just unmuting and just asking your question? If you're not there, um, I'm happy. I'm happy to ask it for you. So she asks, why was the seasonality of the training data not preserved? Did sensitivity analysis suggest that this is less influential than the day of the week? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so we, when thinking about this modelling, you have to remember that you've got two sources of demand. You've got the patients in the ED now, and then you've got the patients yet to arrive. And actually, it's when you've got a whole rich data set on patients in the ED now, that may, be, that may reflect seasonal patterns. So you might have more if it's winter, but actually it's sort of implicit because you're, you're working with real-time data. So you don't need a seasonality element on the sort of ED prediction side. On the yet to arrive, side then yes there is a seasonal component maybe those numbers will be slightly larger in winter um or and actually uclh is actually based in central london so um the student and commuting patterns are, are very relevant and it's quite a young population so there may be other factors that you, you might take into account but actually the yet to arrive data is a smaller component of the demand so even taking seasonality into account, um, you know, would, is not is not necessarily going to be massively incremental to the performance of the models. It would be incremental for sure, but I think it would, and it would be maybe interesting to try. Um, but I think that our decision was kind of pragmatic that actually we we're using really relatively unsophisticated 
uh, heuristics at the at the moment for the yet to arrive patients. And it's definitely it's something that could be added. So be very curious if you find out you can enhance. Um, it, it does come back a bit back to to how you evaluate it because we're only really using that data for understanding the pattern of arrivals um, and and nothing else about those patients. Um, so we're not kind of thinking that you'll have more acute patients yet to arrive in certain period, periods of the, of the winter or anything. Brilliant, thank you. So that's quite a few questions, so I'm just going to rattle through. Um, I think there's a question from Jenna, which is about how is speciality determined for both the visits and the beds? Mm. Is speciality for the new admissions based on the speciality code for the admitting episode or similar, or based on the speciality of the bed location they were admitted to? Oh, good question. Yeah, it's it belongs to the patient, so it's whatever um, uh, special patient is admitted under. Uh, but you're quite right. There is a lot of intricacy between the physical location of a patient and their specialty, where ideally they would be on a ward dedicated to the specialty. But you know, we we're not um, concerned here with the physical imprint of where the specialties sit, just where the patient is is under, and we predict it based on consult requests uh, that come in for them while they're in the emergency department. Brilliant. Um, there's another question from Anthony. Um, Anthony, if you're there, let me know if you want to ask your question. Um, yeah, I can I can do that. Um, so I was just interested in in the difference between uh, demand and activity. So uh, at the moment, the, the model seems to be trained on actual prior activity, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, what we're trying to do is to predict demand. Therefore, something like uh, the four hour performance, therefore, could impact whether an actual admission happens within an, any timed window. Mm -hmm. So are you training the data based on the actual admission time or on a time, say, four hours from arrival? Excellent, excellent question. So that's I alluded to the idea that we're using an aspirational approach. So we don't at, we don't look at how long it takes someone to be processed through the department at all. We just look at their the arrival time at the front door, um, and then we use this aspirational approach to decide their probability of being admitted within the the window concerned. So if you're in, let's say we're making predictions at midday, someone who arrives at uh, seven pm will have a relatively low probability of being admitted before the end of the prediction window if that's at 8 8, 8 p.m. But someone who arrives at 1 a.m. Uh, sorry, 1 p.m. or someone who's in the ED now should have a high probability of being admitted. So we're not we're not using any past data on how long it takes um, in, in reality, given underperforming ED uh, departments in, in the last um, in a few years. So what that allows is then we, we can go to the hospital and say, hey, this is your true demand if your ED is meeting its targets not the demand that reflects the, your activity patterns over the last X years. Um, does that fully answer the question? Uh, is there something else in it? Yeah, yeah, I think it did. I've, I've got another question, but I'll keep quiet for a while. Okay. Uh, whilst, whilst you're here, Anthony, do you want to just ask it? Uh, okay, so the you're making predictions of demand based upon the aggregate of people in the department is my understanding, rather than necessarily making a prediction of demand based upon people at a row level and aggregating from that. Why did you take that approach? Uh, sorry, could you just repeat the distinction? So I, you don't appear to be making a, a prediction based upon whether an individual patient admits. You appear to be making a prediction based upon the, the number, the, the, the type and variation of patients in the department and therefore what do we expect the total number of admissions yeah. to be rather than yeah. doing it on a, on a kind of patient level. So so why did you take that approach rather than... So to uh, clarify, we are, and, and please correct me if I haven't understood your question, but to clarify, we are, for each individual patient, you generate a probability of admission for the patients in the emergency department now. So let's say there are 60 in the emergency department now, we're going to need some number of beds between zero and 60, but we generate 60 probabilities. Um, and right. it would be like 60 rolls of a dice, um, except that each one has their own different probability. Some will have very low if they've, they, you know, they've just been to the urgent treatment centre, um, uh, whereas someone who resus will have a high probability, as an example. So, um, so then we use those 60 individual probabilities to generate a distribution uh, of number of beds given given those those individual level 
So that's what I said at the beginning about aggregating up from an individual level to a, to a bed demand level of prediction. Okay, cool. I might have missed something there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Stella. Um, Roberto asked a question about publications relating to the evaluation and development, but I understand you've uh, published on nature um, and there's a link to it in the chat. I'm going to move on to Tom's question. Um, and he asks about how extensively patient flow has been used clinically and is it active daily and overall kind of what the impact of this application has been on UCLH? So clinically is an interesting um, choice of word because this is an operational rather than a clinical model. So just again, to clarify, this is not being used to predict and for clinicians look at any individual patient and say, I think that person's got a high, high probability, therefore I should admit them. This is used by bed managers. So it's in that that's what I mean by it's operational rather than clinical. But it is being these these predictions are being sent five times a day. They're incorporated into the um, spreadsheets that the bed managers send around the hospital uh, and they're using them to inform their decisions about whether to take actions like um, raising what's called a red alert, where clinicians are supposed to stop doing clinics and start focusing on wards to see if they can discharge patients earlier or contacting the the integrated care board to see if they can divert ambulances so there's like there's lots of escalation decisions cancelling surgeries um which have an, an enormous amount of impact on on patients and staff uh, and so the idea of this is the bed managers are using these operationally to help inform those decisions and then and then to take escalation actions sort of um with with well-informed timely accurate data Brilliant. Um, there is a follow up, which is, is there any work towards getting a UK CA slash CE marking? Ooh, I'm afraid I don't know um, well, uh, very much about that. So I, I can't. So there's no intent, um, but I'd be interested to know more. Great. Um, there's a question from Yasmin, which is which teams within Epic did this require collaboration with and what kind of work was required from them? Yeah, so that's a, a good question. It it slightly predates me in the sense when I arrived four years ago, uh, the there'd been a lot of work already to create this database called EMAP, um, which receives real time data from the back of Epic. So I know that one of the requirements of Epic, um, I don't know if you know the, the concept of HL7 messages, but they are kind of messages emitted in a standard format by health record systems that are used to communicate with other systems. So EMAP is essentially eavesdropping on HL7 messages that are sent out by EPIC and then formatting those into a real-time data database. Uh, so there was a lot of work to build EMAP in, originally. Um, however, I think, my again, my colleague John Gillam is very keen that this you don't need a, anything as sophisticated as EMAP to do this. Any EHR that has HL7 messages um, could be used for this purpose and, and John's a real advocate for sort of us taking this forward you know e neutral of any particular EHR so um, the answer to your question is there was some involvement at the beginning to get Epic to switch on the right HL7 messages uh, but other than that their team is relatively un unimpacted within the hospital. Great. Um, there's another question, which is when when you mean patient flow, do you mean the system C application? Oh, no, I didn't know there was a patient flow application inside system C. No, I'm talking about the repository, the GitHub repository patient flow that we've created. Brilliant. Um, so another question about why you chose XGBoost. So mm -hmm. how was XGBoost chosen in the end? Did you compare with other models like random forest decision tree? Um, and yeah, how did that, how did XGBs come up from top against the other models? Yeah, so excellent question. So in the Nature paper, uh, we do compare XGBs with random forest and logistic regression. And it, uh, the reason for picking it originally is, uh, and I still would hold to this, is that it handles missing data uh, as, you know, as part of its uh, modus operandi. Missing data is not problematic. Whereas if you use 
um, random forest, you have to impute all your missing variables. And when you think about patients in an emergency department, a lot of missingness is actually very significant. So if someone has not had their blood pressure or their heart rate measured, that may be because they're just sitting waiting to have a sprained ankle strapped and no one's worrying about their vital signs. So the missingness of that information is, is in itself indicative of the fact they're unlikely to be admitted. Um, so XGBoost is really good for that because it, it missing values could, could be incorporated into its decision tree um, structure and used in a sort of predictive manner. With, so with um, this logistic regression and random forest, we had to impute missing values or found a different way of handling them. Um, that said, with the penalised logistic regression, it performed almost as well as XGBoost, uh, but it takes much longer time to train. So my conclusion is XGBoost is really fast to train, handles missing values and does just as well as in any other classifier we've tried. Brilliant, very well articulated. Um, this question from Liam, which is, is there any aspiration to incorporate external data to further improve the understanding of patients who have not arrived yet? Mm. For example, weather, pollution, football match days, things like that. Mm. Yeah, so I guess the most obvious external data could be ambulance um, conveyancing. Uh, because that would rather just using past patterns of um, arrivals and you'd, you'd know something about what's this, the state of London in real time. Um, I think the sort of the sort of pollution or other kind of seasonality factors, again, they sort of play into um, the yet to arrive patients, the ones who haven't arrived yet. Uh, which, as I said before, is a small element of the modelling. So I think it would it could be a tiny bit incremental to include some some further external variables, weather. Um, but but I think yeah, it's a, all of this is a trade off. I think whereas the most the better payoff for modelling time was really with kind of looking at um, the patients in the ED now because they are the majority of the. Of the likely demand in the next eight hours. As I said, I said at the beginning, that if you expanded the prediction window and you said, actually, no, I'm interested in 24 hours, not not um, eight hours or four hours, then having real time information about who's in your hospital now is m m less relevant over 24 hours. And then it might be really useful to know if it's a bank holiday or school holidays or, you know, very hot or high, high pollen counts or whatever. So, yeah, there's that I think it's a partly depends on how you frame the problem so how much you'd want to take that sort of stuff into account brilliant um i just see one last question which is kind of like how one would implement that implement this in their hospital so yeah. this is from i think saha if i wanted to implement this in my hospital would this be led by it or do you think this is something a doctor a pharmacist or a nurse with python knowledge could lead on um Good question. I think you can do a lot with Python knowledge and an interest. Um, so our experience was this began with a proof of concept where no one from IT in the hospital really had very much involvement at all. What you do need is data from your hospital. So you need kind of data analysts to work with you to extract the data for training. Um, and the, again, one of the reasons why I've have shared the synthetic data set so that you can see what uh, data might need to look like and so you could go to one of your data colleagues and say I can, can I get a, a data set in this kind of format it would require some work from them um, but that would be a starting point and then you can do a bit of proof of concept modeling um, using python and using the code that we've shared uh, and then at that point, I think you might want to go back to someone in the hospital and say, we think this is valuable. We've evaluated these models. We think this could tell us something that we, we don't currently know. So then you would need IT um, to set up an application to, to run in real time. But all of the prior steps could be done without any kind of direct IT involvement. And I mean, knowing what hospitals are like, you have to have quite a strong case to get time from either EHR teams or IT teams. So if you've done your prior work in terms of like doing proof of concept, showing that it could be useful, then, yeah, I think you'd take, you you might be able to make a case. Brilliant. Um, sorry, I think I botched your name. Is it Saha? I think you want to follow up. 
Uh, yeah, so it's Shah. S H A H. Shah. It's, it's, a, it's a short and sweet. So, um, thank you for your answer and thank you for your presentation. I think it was really good. Um, I'm uh, someone who's a pharmacist. I lead medicines information at North Middlesex Hospital. Um, I've been coding for about two years, so I've a lot of mm. experience with React. Um, so React and JavaScript on the front end. I'm quite interested in Python and backend and um, SQL. So I have experience with, you know quite a bit of this and I'm interested to know more. I haven't really started with AI, but I'm, I'm particularly interested. Do you think, um, based on my questions, do you think there's a way we can set up avenues uh, for healthcare professionals to make SQL queries um, on their own accord? Um, I know there's a danger because you could, in theory, um, remove items from a data set and actually granularizing, making something granular in terms of access, it could be a, a problem. But do you think there could be a way we can set up an incentive to ask IT departments to allow us to make SQL queries ourselves? Because what you're talking about is probably the way I'm, I've been trying to do things. The only issue is um, our EPMA team were having trouble. Uh, our clinical informatics uh, department, they uh, they're really flooded in terms of time, but if I could find a way of just making my own queries in my own time, I think we can go really, really far. Is there a way we can we can set up some sort of um, initiative to actually make healthcare professionals have better access to making this these queries, and then that way we don't have to request this data manually from people. We can just write these queries ourselves. Yeah, uh, for sure. I think it's a it's a brilliant um, proposal and. I don't know whether the AFA, the Association of Professional Healthcare Analysts, it would be a good sort of forum for that kind of uh, coordinated effort, or whether they're already doing something. I think there are databases that can be queried with with SQL. Um, they and they'll be they'll be used in your hospital by inf BI analysts, business information analysts, and people doing reporting. It won't it won't be the won't necessarily be real time. It could be updated. Um, every day at midnight but actually we still get a long way with that in terms of proof of concept and demonstrating the value of your modeling getting real-time data uh, people would be nervous I think about SQL on sort of real-time live databases because of the sort of kind of performance issues that you alluded to um, but yeah I think it's a hospital by hospital decision at that point um but yeah we but you're in the same integrated care board as we are so let's and i, and I know that ncl are really interested in this stuff so let's let's catch up about that separately um i'm just conscious of time i think benjamin would you be able just to ask your question very briefly to solo mm -hmm. yeah. yeah sure hi, hi sir um i just wanted to um check that I'd understood correctly. So with the the kind of the model on the yet to arrive component of patients, um, so is that solely predicting kind of the the volume of future A and E attendees? And then if so, is um is the proportion of those that then go on to be admitted kind of modeled separately? So with that one is not modeling the front door, it's modeling the sort of door in, into the hospital. So we only look at admitted patients. And we're looking at, uh, and we're looking within this eight hour window. So we're saying if it's midday now, um, we know about all these patients who are currently in. So we've got our model for them. And then we, between now and 8 p.m., we should expect some more. But we, we only use, um, the, for the modeling for that, we only use past data on patients who were admitted. So we kind of disregard all of the flows through the ED that might come and go in that time and not be admitted. And we're just kind of going, how many more admissions can we expect in that in that next data out period? OK, got it. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Zella, for your fantastic presentation of fielding the question time uh, segment. Um, we're going to thank follow you, thank up. You all for your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Stella. And um, we're going to follow up with the link to the YouTube and the GitHub repo and also with Zella's contacts if you need to get in touch with her at all. But thanks, everyone, again. And yeah, round of applause to Zella. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Take thank care. you. And thanks, Mary, as well, for chairing. Thank you, Stella. Bye, everyone. Bye.